Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar titled Putting New Family Pack Benefits to Work in Patient Care. Uh, we hope you are all doing well and staying safe. My name is Nicole Nguyen. I'm the program manager of the Family Planning Program here at the California Prevention Training Center. Uh, the CAPTC, under contract with the California Department of Healthcare Services Office of Family Planning, is sponsoring today's event. We welcome you. Um, so, before we get started, uh, let's just go over some really quick housekeeping slides. So first, please check your audio and select your desired settings to join either through your computer audio or through your phone. If your internet connection is shaky, we highly recommend that you call it in so that you can get the best possible sound and there's no interruptions. Um, second, please check that you're able to see the viewer screens with the slides on your left and the GoToWebinar control panel on the right. Um, and then there's this orange box uh, with the white arrow. This is how you can hide or show your dashboard. So if you don't want to see it or you accidentally clicked it and this is how you can make it appear again. Under that is the audio setting where you can change your audio preference at any time. And also please submit all your comments and questions via the questions box. Um, so before I introduce our presenter, I want to acknowledge that we're really excited to be working with the University, University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine to provide CMEs for this event. So this webinar will qualify for a 1.5 CME credit and is only available to those who watch the entire webinar live today. So those who watch the recordings afterwards will not be eligible for the CME credits or if you watch in groups and didn't register yourself, unfortunately we won't be able to give you those credits either. Um, and we'll make sure everyone get the link to access your CME certificate uh, in the follow-up email along with all the materials that we shared today, uh, like the recordings, the slides, and then the evaluation survey. Um, and then of course, for transparency, we wanna state that all of our presenters, planners, anyone in a position to control the content of this um, CME activity have indicated that they nor their spouse legally recognize domestic partners have any financial relationships with the commercial interest to the content of this activity. All right, so now I'd like to introduce you to our two presenters. Our first one will be Lamont Weaver. Lamont is our program, a health program specialist for the Office of Family Planning. He has been with OFP for three years. He works for the research evaluation and data section of the program. And his experience has afforded him the ability to work on everything from enrollment and compliance to policy and provider training. He'll be sharing with us some updates regarding the public health emergency wind down. So thank you Lamont for joining us today. And then next, as always, we're really excited to have Dr. Michael Polakar with us. Dr. Polakar served as clinical professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. From 2005 to 2014, he was the medical director of program support and evaluation for the Family PAC program. Um, and he also administered by the California Department of Public Health Services. Um, Office of Family Planning. He currently serves as Professor Emeritus of, Obstet of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at UCSF. So we're always excited to have him share all his new FPAC knowledge with us. And so with that, um, Lamont and Mike, the floor is yours. Okay. So let me so, um, stop share so that you can- Lamont is going first. Um, yes, sir. All right. Uh, hang on. Uh, let me make, okay. sorry. There we go. There you go. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay, good. And here. Okay. What? Can you see that? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Yes, I can. And I will go. Um, so, uh, regarding the public health emergency unwinding, um, just a little background. Um, during, of course, uh, during the uh, national public health emergency in response to COVID-19, um, Medi-Cal's standard operational um, standard operations of um, which consisted of annual, um, you know, evaluations of Medi-Cal and eligibility was temporarily halted to ensure that beneficiaries had ongoing access to health coverage during the pandemic. Um, now that the public health emergency is starting to unwind, which um, as uh, currently stated, um, the, uh, the PHE is currently um, extended to July 15th of this year. Um, the Medi-Cal will have, um, after that date, uh, Medi-Cal uh, for the next 14 months um, will be returning to normal eligibility um, and enrollment operations, which, um, and this involves the conducting the full renewal of enrollment for all beneficiaries, 
which um, during the time period from um, beginning of uh, from the beginning of the public health emergency um, to now, um, Medi-Cal enrollment increased um, about 16% actually. So uh, from uh, 12 and a half million in March 2020 to 14 and a half million today. Um, so what um, the Department of Healthcare Services they've been working. Um, uh, to prepare for this unwinding for a while now. And uh, the department has reached out uh, to provide information and guidance to healthcare plans and counties and have uh, begun, actually begun um, direct outreach to beneficiaries to um, help uh, build, to be able to uh, ensure that they, um, to either in, to ensure that they keep their current Medi-Cal coverage or be able to help and guide uh, for those who, uh, could potentially lose their coverage to ensure that they be able to receive um, either, you know, either low cost coverage from Covered California or um, other government programs or transition to their in, uh, employer sponsored health coverage if need be. So the department has begun the Department of uh, Healthcare Coverage's uh, Coverage Ambassador Campaign um, as part of this initiative. Um, and these ambassadors can include uh, the Department of Healthcare Service providers, managed care plans, local health offices, health navigators, advocates, community organizations, stakeholders, healthcare facilities, clinics, and other state agencies. Um, we, uh, along with this initiative, uh, it, they have implemented a two-phased uh, communication campaign to reach the beneficiaries across the line. So during this phase one approach, which is going on right now, um, ambassadors in this program will, will reach out to beneficiaries to update their contact information um, if they haven't done so already. So they can be uh, contacted with important information about keeping their benefits. Um, the, there is currently, and um, I'll offer it in the resource slides um, in the chat box later, um, there is uh, actually a toolkit, um, a Medi-Cal toolkit that is, uh, and a, um, a site on the department's webpage um, to help the ambassadors um, with communications to the beneficiaries. Um, this toolkit includes uh, social media prompts, call scripts, website banners. Um, and uh, during this phase one, so just really encouraging to reach out to beneficiaries during this time period so they can have uh, this the most up-to-date information possible. Um, now, I mentioned the uh, unwind, uh, the PhD is expected to uh, extend to July 15th. Um, phase two of this communication approach, um, which will include, you know, continue to include um, reaching out to beneficiaries to update their contact information, um, as well as report any changes in their circumstance, uh, circumstances, um, as well as checking for um, ensuring that the beneficiaries are checking. You know, that's why we want to have those latest um, those latest uh, contact information on file. So, be, uh, so when um, the renew packets, renewal packets, Medi-Cal renewal packets go out um, can, uh, through mail, um, they can be received. And this next phase, um, this next phase of uh, that approach will begin about 60 days prior um, to the end of public health emergency. So we're getting to that time period right now. And um, in addition to the resources that I'm going to have, um, Med, uh, DHS will actually have a webinar um, the week after next on the 24th, I believe on the 24th and 25th uh, webinar to uh, go over the entire campaign in full. Um, the, the toolkit and other resources um, are also available on the website and will be provided um, through this as well. Okay, great. Right. Thank you a lot. And, and uh, we'll uh, address your questions later um, uh, when we do the, the Q and A. And just let me emphasize something that Lamont was was talking about. I mean, during the public health emergency, there were just so many people who were not Medi-Cal beneficiaries before the public health emergency who became enrolled uh, in Medi-Cal, and it's such a, an amazing, you know, wonderful program. You know, better than most state Medicaid programs, I, I'd say better than just about every state Medicaid program. And that being the case, given the broad range of services that people get um, with Medi-Cal, um, by all means, they should make every attempt to continue to, to obtain their coverage um, in that way. One in three Californians who have insurance are covered in Medi-Cal. 
Okay, well, let's move on to our major topic today, which are new benefits in Family Pact. Um, these are our learning objectives. We're going to talk about a number of new contraceptive benefits that um, have been added as um, Family Pact benefits that will be available to you. Uh, we'll talk about uh, a couple of new diagnostic tests for sexually transmitted infections, specifically focusing on mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, and then um, the second half of the talk will be a little bit of a repeat of the presentation that Ina Park and I did about a year ago on the 2021 CDC STD treatment guidelines. But the reason that I've added it in this time uh, is because the Office of Family Planning has now adopted most of the antibiotic regimens that are contained in the 2021 CDC STD treatment guidelines. So we're going to start with the new contraceptive benefits, but I do want to tell you about sort of some initial information that I think is really important to know um, relative to how the benefits were structured. One of the things you might not realize about, about Family Pact is that it was one of the first national, one of the first family programs nationally to make it a benefit for people to get a full year supply of their hormonal contraceptives. Of course, that started with the full year supply of oral contraceptives and then was extended to other hormonal contraceptives af afterwards. Um, so it is currently a state law in California based on California Senate Bill 999, which was signed about five years ago. Um, and then embedded in, in, a, in a number of different uh, state regulations uh, regarding the fact that in both uh, family pack, Medi-Cal, as well as commercial health plans, that people uh, have the right to get access to a full year of hormonal contraceptives. So you can see that this is contained in the Business and Professions Code, the Health and Safety Code, the Insurance Code for Commercial Insurance, and the Welfare and Institutions Code. It all basically says the same thing. And that is that a pharmacist shall dispense at a patient's request up to a year long supply of an FDA approved self administered hormonal contraceptive. So basically, what that refers to is pills, patches, rings, um, uh, progestinally mini pills, and so on, be, uh, because they are self administered. And now, of course, that even uh, includes. Um, uh, depo sub Q as well, as we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, but at any rate, if a patient asks, then the pharmacist has to um, basically uh, make available a full year supply of uh, the, uh, the prescribed contraceptive. And it's not only true in Medi-Cal and in Family Pact, but it also applies to commercial insurance as well. Um, uh, in the uh, in the insurance code. So basically, people in California for the last five years have been guaranteed a full year supply of their contraceptive choice. Now, the reason for that has to do with a number of studies that were published in the early 2000s, actually based on the family pack population. The first was in 2006 that looked at um, family planning outcomes when uh, a full year supply of oral contraceptives was made available. And then five years after that, another article that had to do with pregnancy outcomes for people who were dispensed a full year supply of hormonal contraceptives. Since then, there have been four more studies that have been published about uh, the cost effectiveness uh, of this approach, which I won't go through in regard to time. But I do want to tell you about the two family pack studies uh, that we did years ago to sort of validate this approach. Um, uh, Diana Green Foster being the primary uh, author of these articles. So the first looked at of people who had their first visit in January 2003, women who were dispensed to full 13 cycles of oral contraceptives used 14 and a half cycles during the year in comparison to people who were dispensed three cycles who only used about nine cycles during the year. Of course, we used uh, paid claims data in order to be able to compute this. Now, compared with the women who only received three cycles of oral contraceptives, those who were given a full year supply were almost 30% more likely to have oral contraceptive pills on hand and twice as likely to have a sufficient supply of oral contraceptives for 15 months of continuous use. So with that full year supply, 
um, obviously um, people had that immediately available to them. And despite having one fewer clinician visit during the year, women who were dispensed 13 cycles were actually more likely, likely rather, to have cervical cancer screening with cervical cytology test and chlamydia test, and less likely to have a pregnancy test than women who were initially dispensed fewer cycles. So one of the concerns um, initially was that if we gave people a full year of, let's say, oral contraceptives, that they wouldn't come back and get the screening tests that they needed for cervical cancer and for chlamydia. But it turns out that among the women who were dispensed a year of oral contraceptives, they were actually more likely to come back for those screening tests and less likely to need a pregnancy test. Now, another thing that we were concerned about was if you gave someone 13 cycles of pills in advance, how likely were they to actually use those pills as opposed to just wasting them, throwing them away, not using them? And what um, Dr. Foster Green was able to compute was the fact that for those people who use 13 cycles, um, about 6.5% of cycles were not used. If they were dispensed three cycles, then about 2% of cycles were not used. But in a way, this was really good news for us because it told us that in the large majority of circumstances, when people were dispensed 13 cycles, they actually use 13 cycles. So it was fairly uncommon for people to be dispensed um, cycles of oral contraceptives that they didn't use in either case. And then that first study also showed that it was cost savings compared to women who received 13 cycles um, of oral contraceptives over a year, Family Pact actually paid almost $100 more for women who received three cycles and about $44 more for people who received one cycle. So that was the first study, made it pretty clear about the fact that by giving people a full year of pills, they were more likely to use them, low likelihood of wastage, and it was actually costing. Five years later, that led to a second study. And in this second study, um, Dr. Foster Green was able to do the most incredible work, she and Dennis Hollett, uh, where they were able to link the family packed claims database with the Medi-Cal claims database. So they were able to follow tens of thousands of people over a period of time, during which time they were um, members of Family Pact, and then later might have gotten services through Medi-Cal, particularly in regard to pregnancy care. So what this looks at is, in the first row, people who got one cycle of pills, then, then three cycles of pills, then the people who got a whole year of pills, 12 or 13 cycles. What we find, if you look in that third line with the red numbers, is that their continuation rate was much higher at 15 months in comparison to people who only got one or three cycles of pills. They were less likely to switch to another method, only about 7% of people did. The likelihood that they would have a claim for anything related to pregnancy was only about a third. In other words, people who got one cycle of pills, 3% had a pregnancy claim. But of people who got 12 or 13 cycles of pills, only 1% of people had a pregnancy claim. And then finally, for those people who got 13 cycles of pills, they were substantially less likely to have abortion services paid for. So this was profoundly important because it showed that this approach of 13 cycles all at once was not only safe and cost savings, but that it actually changed longer term outcomes so that there were fewer undesired pregnancies and a lower abortion rate. Uh, for people who were able to get 13 cycles. So it was that kind of study, that kind of information that came from the Family Pact program that led the state legislature to um, subsequently approve uh, that Senate Bill 999 that I mentioned, so that now people can get a full year supply of their hormonal contraceptives. You'll see a lot more of that once we go through each individual method. So here are the methods that we're going to talk about um, that are all new family packed benefits with the exception of the one at the bottom. Trospirinone progestin only pill with the brand name of SLIND is not a family packed benefit, it's not a Medi Cal benefit. But the ones which have been added as both family packed and Medi Cal benefits are a one year contraceptive vaginal ring called Anovera, a new contraceptive vaginal gel called Fexi, a lower dose contraceptive patch called Twirla. I'll tell you about all of those in detail. Next is a generic version of NuvaRing, which is called 
Alu ring, and some pharmacies are now starting to stock that, and of course that would be uh, covered by, by Family Pact. I'll remind you of a topic that we talked about in earlier webinars, which is um, DMPA or Depo-Provera sub-Q, which is um, self-injected um, by patients, which is now a permanent benefit uh, in Family Pact. And then I'll tell you a little bit about SLIND, even though it's not a Family Pact benefit or a Medi-Cal benefit, I think it would be helpful for you to know about that as one of the newer products uh, which is on the market. So let's start with the ethyl estradiol segesterone anovera contraceptive vaginal ring. And I've tried to make clear what these various abbreviations mean, and you can see the ring there. So the basics about anovera is that one ring will prevent ovulation for a whole year, 13 cycles. So person obtains this ring, learns how to use it, and then can use that same ring over a full year period. Its components are ethanol estradiol, which is the same estrogen which is in the pill, the patch, the ring, nothing new there. But there is a brand new progestin, which is called segesterone acetate, the trade name of which is nesterone, that is uniquely suited for this idea of having it in a ring for a period of a full year. It's used in a 28-day cycle um, so that it's in for 21 days, it's out for seven days, during which time a person will have a um, withdrawal bleed, a menses. The side effect um, profile and the bleeding profile is quite similar to the Nuva ring, which of course is a once a month ring. And it has the same diameter as the Nuva ring, but it is twice as thick. I will show you some photographs of that in just a moment. It was developed by an organization in New York called the Population Council that sponsored almost all the clinical trials about the Anovera ring. Um, it is currently licensed and owned by a company called Therapeutics MD, and it was approved by the FDA uh, in August of 2018. So it's been out um, for a little over three years. Now, um, it works well in perfect use. In other words, in the clinical trials that were done with Anovera, the pregnancy rate was three pregnancies per 100 couples per year, which puts it in that same level or the same tier of efficacy as pills, patches, the Nuva Ring, uh, DMPA, which is considered to be sort of the middle, epic, middle level of, of uh, efficacy, not as, as effective as the long-acting reversible contraceptive methods like IUDs and implants, but uh, but certainly on the upper end of that middle tier of contraceptive efficacy. Now, another logical question is, well, that, that was in clinical trials. How about in real world use? And unfortunately, those failure rates haven't been published yet, but they'll probably be around the same ballpark as uh, oral contraceptives, patches, rings, somewhere around five, six, or seven up to nine failures per 100 couples per year. But that's just a guess. We know that in the studies, it was three pregnancies per 100 couples per year. Who can use it? Basically, anyone who can use oral contraceptives, who can use the Nuva ring, who can use contraceptive patches can also use Anavera, given the fact that it's a combined hormonal method with estrogen and progestin. How it's used, it's pretty much the same as other hormonal contraceptives um, in terms of when it started uh, and how quickly it works. And that is, uh, once the ring is inserted, uh, it has a fairly rapid um, onset of action in terms of providing uh, protection against uh, ovulation and pregnancy. So the way that Anovera is intended to be used is that it's, <clears throat> excuse me, in place in the vagina for 21 days, then it's removed for seven days, the idea being a hormone-free interval to induce a scheduled withdrawal bleed. But of course, one question that we all ask is, well, if it's a ring that lasts for a whole year, could a person use it continuously, just every single day, without taking it out, without having a withdrawal bleed, without having any menstrual periods? And at least at this point, there's only a single study that had looked at this that was published in contraception last year. And it was basically sort of a modeling study that looked at levels of the segesterone acetate after 36 months, um, excuse me, I, it's having difficulty seeing what was in the slide there. And so it looked at 
predicted segesterone levels after 364 days, a full year of hypothetical continuous use. And it was comparable to the levels at which no pregnancy happens. Now, again, this is not a study in a big population of people using Anavera continuously for a year. It was much more of a modeling study that looked at segesterone acetate levels for a year, um, you know, hypothetically for continuous use, and that level was high enough that no ovulation and therefore no pregnancy uh, uh, would be predicted to have occurred. So we have this sort of modeling study that says, yes, it can be used continuously for a year, but we don't have that um, study done yet in populations of patients. Other things about Anavera is that, um, as opposed to the new ring, this one does not require refrigeration while it's being stored. It can be removed for up to two hours for intercourse or for cleaning. And so the advice is to wash the ring with mild soap, lukewarm water, rinse it, dry it off, and then put it back in. But try not to have it outside of the body any longer than two hours. Uh, and a person can use water-based creams and lubricants uh, in the vagina at the same time that the anovera ring is being used. However, you, uh, the patient should not use oil-based or silicone-based um, lubricants because of the fact that it changes the blood levels of ethanolestradiol uh, and uh, segesterone. Okay, so examples of particularly silicone-based lubricant might be um, various kinds of um, you know, so-called um, intimate lubricants, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, astroglide and others. Now, astroglide, of course, has both a water-based version and a silicone-based version, but the point is, is that a person should not use vaginal products that either has oil or a silicone base uh, to it, only water-based creams uh, and lubricants. This slide is a comparison of the ring that you're familiar with, the Nuva ring, and the new ring, the Anavera. So obviously the big difference is the lifespan, where the Nuva ring is active for 30 days while the Anavera is active for one year. The, there are different progestins, but the doses are about the same. Both of them have ethanol estradiol as the estrogen component. The daily release rate is almost identical between um, the Nuva ring and Anavera. Uh, they both have almost identical diameters, but the anovera is significantly thicker. And then there's also a different kind of plastic used to release both the ethanol estradiol and the segesterone acetate. Okay, so the big difference, again, is the thickness. So here's a comparison of what Nuva Ring looks like. 54 millimeters across, 4 millimeters uh, is the thickness of the ring itself. The middle picture compares the diameter to, to a dime. Uh, and then you see on the right side, the photograph of Anavera showing that it's exactly the same diameter, more or less as the new ring, but twice as thick, okay? And this is kind of the same thickness as some of the estrogen rings uh, that are used for uh, menopausal uh, hormonal therapy uh, as well. Now, if you look at some of the marketing literature about the Anavera uh, contraceptive vaginal ring, they will tell you that it's marketed as the, quote, first woman control, procedure-free, long-acting, reversible birth control product, putting the woman in control of her fertility and menstruation. So what they seem to be saying is this is a LARC, a long-acting, reversible method of contraception, kind of in the same vein as the implant and the IUD. But is it really a LARC? And the answer is, yeah, it's, the description is accurate because a person can use the same ring for a full year. But in some ways, it really is not a lark because of the fact that it has to be removed every month in order to have that, that uh, withdrawal bleed uh, over a seven-day period. And number two, it has to be replaced within two hours after cleaning. And therefore, it's not a forgettable contraceptive like an IUD or an implant. Obviously, with IUDs and implants, there's just one effort. To, to do the insertion of the IUD or the implant. Following that, it's forgettable for years at a time. That won't be true with the Anavera because of the need um, to, uh, uh, to at least remove it and wash it, if not to remove it and have a withdrawal bleed. So um, Family Pact has made this a contraceptive benefit. Um, it became a benefit on October 1st of uh, 2021. So uh, 
The way that it's billed, if you dispense it in the clinic, is J7294, one ring per dispensing, basically, because it lasts for a whole year. And by the way, the reimbursement rate, just to give you some sense of what Family Pact is paying for these uh, methods, uh, is just about $2,100 for the full year. Um, and there's a maximum of two dispensings of the ring during a 12-month period, taking a, into account the fact that some people might use it for 11 months and then they're going on vacation, they need their next ring a little early. So that's why there can be two dispensing within the 12-month period. The next one down is the Nuva ring. Uh, the reimbursement rate for that is $121 and change. Um, that is per cycle, per month, basically. And up to 13 rings can be dispensed uh, because there is an assumption that some people are going to use the Nuva ring continuously. We'll put it in on the first of the calendar month, use it until the end of the calendar month, take out the old ring, put in a new ring on the first of the next calendar month. So it's basically continuous use of the Nuva ring without a hormone-free interval, without a um, uh, withdrawal bleed, which for the patient is like a menstrual period. Uh, and therefore, you would need 13 rings in order to be able to have a whole year of continuous use. And again, a maximum of two dispensings uh, during a 12-month period. If a person needs a third dispensing during that 12-month period, then a treatment authorization request or a TAR is necessary. Okay, so that tells you about uh, um, Enovera. Next is a contraceptive vaginal gel, uh, which is called Fexi. And so the content of Fexi is a combination of lactic acid, citric acid, and potassium bitartrate uh, in a unique sort of vehicle which has adherence characteristics such that it sticks to the vaginal sidewalls well to keep the vaginal uh, environment acidic for an extended period of time. You know, person could have used some kind of like water-based vaginal gel that dropped the pH, but in the past, um, those only worked for a few hours. This one works for, for somewhat longer, um, given the sort of high-tech approach to the adhesive uh, that's contained uh, within Fexi. So what it does is to induce an acidic pH in the environment between 3.5 and 4.5. And what that does is that it's toxic to sperm. It reduces sperm motility. Now, it's effective only if it's used before intercourse. If it's put in after intercourse, it doesn't work at all. It has to be before. And it can be put in anywhere between immediately before intercourse, always, all the way up to one hour before each episode of intercourse. So a person can put an application of it into the vagina, have sex two minutes from now, 20 minutes from now, all the way up until an hour from now. But if more than an hour has elapsed, elapsed rather, then you have to put in an, another applicator because it will only work for a period of about an hour. Number two, and you wouldn't normally expect this, it's available only by prescription only. So I actually ask the people from the company that made it, well, why is that? I mean, does it have anything in it which is particularly dangerous? Why not make it over the counter? And their response was that because of the fact that this is a brand new product, it doesn't have hormones in it, it has a really diff different mechanism of action, it doesn't contain the same sorts of detergents of the nanoxanol 9, which is in other spermicides, they felt strongly that people needed to be counseled by a clinician about how to use these correctly. So that's why it's prescription only, it's not a safety issue, it's, it's a way of kind of enforcing the fact that patients will need to be counseled by clinicians or health educators about how to use Fexi. Now, how, the, how well does it work? Well, the published failure rate over second, seven cycles of typical use is roughly 14 uh, pregnancies per 100 couples per year. Okay, I, I rounded that up. It's 13.7 uh, failures which per seven months, which is equivalent to that of a diaphragm. And of course, that's the figure that the FDA looked at in approving that figure. Thing is, is that when you look at the effectiveness of most other contraceptive methods, it looks at the failure rate for 100 couples per 12 months for a whole year, okay? And in the package insert, they estimate the Pearl Index, the failure rate for a full year, and they say it comes out to about 27 failures 
per 100 couples per year. So that means it's in that bottom tier, in the third tier of efficacy. Of course, the better people are about using it in a highly effective way, according to the rules, the lower the pregnancy rate is going to be. This 14% seven cycle uh, failure rate is typically used. Some people using it directly, some people using it incorrectly. But basically it fits close to the level of other, um, uh, other spermicides and other barrier methods in that third tier uh, of e efficacy. So who can use FEXI? There are no absolute contraindications. The package insert says that we should avoid use in people who have recurrent urinary tract infections or who have had recurrent pyelonephritis, only because of the fact that in the clinical studies there was a, a sort of a minor relationship between the use of FEXI and the development of urinary tract infections. And so there's concern that it might aggravate the situation in people who have recurrent uh, UTIs. And also we should avoid using FEXI in a person's using a vaginal ring. And for the most part, there'd be no reason uh, to use it at the same time um, as a person who's using a contraceptive vaginal ring. So how to use it? It can be used um, with diaphragms, uh, with uh, latex or polyurethane condoms. Uh, there are also studies looking at using FEXI and a variety of other vaginal medications at the same time. So iconazole, tioconazole, which are both antifungal drugs, metronidazole vaginal gel, which of course would be used for bacterial vaginosis. It can be used um, at the same time uh, as FEXI. And again, I'll emphasize that when it needs to be used is immediately before uh, intercourse or up to an hour before intercourse and then an additional dose before each subsequent act of vaginal intercourse. It comes in a box with 12 applicators. Up in the right-hand corner, you'll see what those applicators look like. They're similar in size to a tampon uh, ap applicator. Now, what about side effects? Well, this comes directly from the patient package insert with a sample size of about 2,500 um, females. So uh, there was vulvovaginal burning in 18%, vulvovaginal itching in roughly 14%, a vulvovaginal mycotic infection, which actually uh, refers to uh, vaginal candidiasis in about 9%, an association with a urinary tract infection or pyelonephritis in about 9%, and then partners complained of local discomfort on their penis about 10% of the time. But it was usually minor and almost never a reason to discontinue uh, the use of sexy. So, this gives you an idea about the kinds of things that you might expect in terms of complaints that uh, patients may have uh, once they start using the medication, particularly the itching uh, and burning. Now, one last thing to say about FEXI, which, which um, is kind of forward-looking. We're definitely not at this point yet, but we may be at some point. And that is that there was a study published last year uh, in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the one we refer to as the Gray Journal, about using FEXI as a way of reducing the likelihood of chlamydia and gonorrhea infections, okay? And this article refers to the product as EVO 100, okay? And the reason why is EVOFEN is the name of the company that makes it, so the investigational name for FEXI in the study was EVO 100. So they enrolled, uh, patients uh, between 18 and 45 years of age who had been diagnosed in, as having, having had and treated for either chlamydia or gonorrhea six weeks before enrollment in the study. There were 376 people in the treatment group with EVO 100, 388 people who were in the placebo group, uh, and you can see the racial and ethnic uh, distribution uh, as reported in this particular study, about an equal number of African-American and uh, white patients. So again, they got either the, the treatment product of FEXI or a placebo vaginal gel, and they were instructed to apply the drug up to an hour before each um, sexual act. So what, were the, what, were, what was the outcome? Well, the thing to do is to jump to visit five because there were multiple visits and follow-up. And, and the, the figure on the left refers to rates of chlamydia in this high-risk population. So for people who used the treatment drug, EVO 100, the rate of chlamydia was about 
for people who received the placebo, it was almost 10%. So the point is using this medication to actually reduce the likelihood of acquiring chlamydia by 50%. It was even more profound with gonorrhea. For people who use the study drug, the rate of gonorrhea was a little under 1%. But for people in the placebo group, the rate of gonorrhea was 3.2%. So here what we see in, is an even more profound reduction, oops, there they go again, sorry, in gonorrhea rates of almost 80%. So what we might be looking at in the future is a multi-purpose technology. It may be that this product can be used both as a contraceptive and as a way of preventing the likelihood of gonorrhea and chlamydia. But I want to emphasize it is not FDA approved for the latter purpose yet. That's because there's another big clinical trial that's going on right now to look at the ability of FEXI to prevent chlamydia and gonorrhea. That's the kind of information that's going to be presented to the FDA. And at some point, we may see it labeled both for pregnancy prevention and STD protection, but we're not quite there yet. I just wanted you to know about it. Okay, so what is family pack? Um, the, what is the family pack benefit as it relates to the contraceptive vaginal gel? Um, it's available uh, since July of last year with a HCPCS code of A4269-U5. When it's dispensed, it's dispensed in a box of 12 single-use applicators. There can be up to three dispensings, which means three boxes for 75 day period. And the reimbursement rate to clinics who dispense it is $257 per box of 12, which comes to about $21 per applicator. So, you know, I, again, I, I thought this was important information to let you know about FEXI because compared to other vaginal spermicides, they are all like in the ballpark of somewhere around 10 or $12 for an entire tube of a spermicide, which may last for many, many acts of intercourse. On the other hand, with FEXI, it's basically $21 for every act of intercourse per applicator. Um, but it still, it is covered. There are some people who will be attracted to being able to use a vaginal contraceptive that is not a spermicide, does not have the irritant effect um, of an Amoximol 9, and of course, a product which has um, no hormones in it. Okay, the next method to discuss is a new contraceptive patch. So this is one with ethanol estradiol and levonorgestrel. Its trade name is Twirlo. Excuse me for a second to get a sip of water. Okay, so you may know about the other contraceptive patch, which has been available for a while, which is called Zulane. That is actually the successor to the first contraceptive patch, which was called Orthoebra. So Orthoebra and Zulane are the same thing. But basically, Zulane is 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol and 150 micrograms of norelgestramine, while Twirla has a little less ethanol estradiol and it uses a different progestin, levonorgestrel, which you know all about. Levonorgestrel is a number of oral contraceptives, uh, uh, as well as being the progestin, which is in all the progestin-bearing IUDs, uh, like um, Mirena, Lyleta, uh, Kylena, and so on. Now with Twirla, there are two black box warnings, but I will say that this is true for both patches, both for Zulane and for Twirla. It is contraindicated in women who have a body mass index of 30 kilograms per meter squared or more. And that's true for two reasons. Number one is that based on an increased body weight, the effectiveness starts to drop off significantly. And number two, there is a concern that the estrogen provided to a woman with a BMI of 30 or more would um, lead to an increased risk of venous thromboembolic events. And otherwise, it has the same cardiovascular contraindications uh, for arterial events as the oral contraceptive uh, and the ring. Now, how effective is Twirla? In typical use, overall, it's roughly six pregnancies per 100 couples per year for um, People who have a body mass index of under 25, it drops to a, it's actually improved to a failure rate of about 3.5 pregnancies per 100 couples per year. And for people who have a body mass index between 25 and 30, the failure rate is about 5.7 pregnancies per 100 couples per year. So 
as you can see, if you round that up to six failures per 100 couples per year, that's very comparable to, um, to, the, to the oral contraceptive, to the ring, um, and to the uh, other patch which, which is available. So how is Twirly used? Um, very much in, in the, the same way as Zulane. It's approved for cyclic use, for the patch to be on for 21 uh, days uh, and then off uh, for seven in order to have a withdrawal bleed. Of course, it's one patch per week for each of three weeks and then one week off. The patch can be applied to the abdomen, the buttocks, the torso, torso rather like the ribcage, but not the breast because of the concern that the hormone leaving the patch would go um, straight uh, into the breast. And then, of course, it has to be applied to clean skin. When to use it is that it is initiated uh, the same as any other combined uh, hormonal method. Um, and for, uh, for, for new starters who are not using anything, it really uh, needs to be applied within the first 24 hours after the menses, or if not, if not, applied in that first day after the onset of the menstrual period, um, then, uh, then seven days of the backup is needed. And it, again, the efficacy onset is the same as any other combined method where it becomes effective uh, quite quickly. So again, we have a comparison of the older patch to the newer patch, a comparison of progestins, which are different, but similar doses, a comparison of estrogens, where the Twirla has a lower estrogen dose than does Zulane. I'll show you a photograph of the size in just a moment, but the size of Twirla is double that of Zulane. It's used in exactly the same way, one patch per week for each of three weeks and then a week off. And then there is a different sort of delivery system. Um, in Twirla, it's called the skin fusion system that has no latex. So I wish I had dimensions on here. I'm sorry, I don't. but it gives you an idea about the sort of square appearance of Zulane as opposed to Twirla, which is a greater diameter and is circular uh, in its appearance. So um, uh, what about coverage by Family Pact? So this is covered by Family Pact. Zulane has a billing code, the HIPAA code of J7304U1. And uh, Basically, the reimbursement rate is $13.57 per patch. Um, uh, and um, for Twirla, it, the uh, HICPIC code is J7304-U2, and its reimbursement rate is a little higher, about um, $17.75 per patch. Now, you can dispense, either prescribe or dispense, up to 52 patches. And it's fairly easy to make that computation because the thought is that someone may be using the patch continuously instead of three weeks on, one week off. They use a patch every week, and they use a patch every week for the 52 weeks of the year. So that's why you can dispense up to 52 patches um, of either Zulane or Twirla, which would give a person a full year of protection. Uh, a 12-month supply of the same product of patches can be dispensed twice in a year. Again, the logic being that if a person um, was given a, a year supply, has now used 11 months of it and won't be available next month to get a new supply, that that new supply can be started a little bit early. But if you need to use a third supply in the same year, then that has to be approved uh, by TAR. Okay, next topic. And this is quick because of the fact that we've talked about this before. And this has to do with Depo-Provera sub-Q. So remember during the pandemic, there was a lot of concern by patients who were using Depo-Provera IM to actually leave their home, drive to the clinic, come into the clinic to get their Depo shots. So we did a whole webinar two years ago on the topic of alternatives to Depo IM. So the, the alternatives were you just bite the bullet and come into the clinic anyway to get your Depo 150 injection. Number two is that some clinics were very creative and said, come to our clinic stay in your car and we will literally give you your depot shot while you're in the car. The third was um, to have an in-person visit where you went to a pharmacy and got an IM injection of depot 
150 in a pharmacy given by a pharmacist that was a family pack benefit as of September 1st, 2020. Or you could switch to self-injected Depo-Provera 104 sub-Q, or we recommended that a person could switch to what was called a bridge method, progestin-only pills, pill patch ring, a barrier method until the public health emergency was over and people could come back into clinic. So those were all available. But at any rate, two years ago, um, Depo sub-Q became a family pack benefit as long as it was dispensed by a pharmacy. And so remember the differences between the two are the Depo sub-Q um, is in a pre-filled syringe, ready to use at home, so the client's in control. It uses a shorter, smaller 26 gauge, 3, 3 8 inch needle with only a small amount of fluid being injected sub-Q by the patient herself. But the point is, it's a tiny short needle about what you would expect with like an insulin syringe, for example. So potentially less pain than Depo IM, which is an IM injection. Remember that Depo sub-Q has 30% less hormone, 104 milligrams in comparison to 150 milligrams in Depo IM. And there are fairly similar side effects um, between the two. Local site irritation and soreness on the first and second self-injection, but that has a tendency to get better over time. Okay, so yet another comparison of Depo sub-Q on the top and uh, the intramuscular Depo 150 on the bottom. It just gives you an idea of, of the differences between the two and points out the fact that for Depo sub-Q, there is no generic version. Um, Pfizer is the only company that is allowed to make it. So who are the people that are sort of the best candidates to learn how to self-inject Depo sub-Q? Well, People who have heard about this and said, yeah, I really like the idea of being able to inject myself every 13 to 15 weeks at home. Second, clients who currently receive Depo IM uh, and after counseling say, yeah, sure, I'd be willing to learn how to inject this at home and not have to come into the clinic and get my Depo IM injections. And it's also a good choice for people who already know how to self-inject. So, if you've taken ovulation and induction drugs for in vitro fertilization, you're a diabetic who uses insulin, you've had to use heparin or drugs for multiple sclerosis, you know how to do those self-injections already. The contraindications and side effects for Depo sub-Q are about the same for Depo sub-Q and Depo IM. Um, there's no reason to do any sort of dosage adjustment with either one based on a person's body weight. Um, and whenever a person decides to use Depo sub Q, it's always a good idea to document why that was the case in the patient's uh, medical record. Uh, you know, just uh, for the availability of other clinicians in the future to see why that particular choice was made. Now, the reason I brought this up is because of the fact that there has been an evolution of Depo sub Q 104 as a family packed benefit. So it can be dispensed by a pharmacy directly to a family pack client for self-administration at home. That became a temporary pharmacy benefit in September of 2020, which was really in the first few months after the pandemic started. But it was made a permanent pharmacy benefit as of June 2021. So family pack doesn't pay for this to be dispensed in clinics, but it does pay for this to for you to, um, to transmit a prescription to a pharmacy and then the pharmacy can, um, can, uh, can provide it to a patient. And the earliest refill of a dose of, of, uh, of Depo sub-Q is 80 days. Remember, it can be injected anywhere between 13 weeks and 15 weeks um, to work. Now, I'm going to use this moment as an opportunity to remind you that there have been some major changes in how you get at the family-packed pharmacy formulary. Remember, you could go to the familypack.org website. Then what you could do is to, uh, to go to the provider section, click on the family pack formulary, and that's where you would find the drugs uh, covered by family pack. That is no longer the case. There is a new program that you've probably heard about called Medi-Cal RX. This is for the entirety of the whole Medi-Cal program, whether it's Medi-Cal managed care, Medi-Cal fee for service but it includes family pack as well. So this is the Medi-Cal RX website. 
I'm sure most of you also have Medi-Cal patients in addition to family pack patients. So it's really important to have a look at this. So basically the interaction of Medi-Cal RX and family pack is that the administration of all Medi-Cal pharmacy benefits, fee for service um, in Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal managed care and family pack is now through this program includes all pharmacy services billed as a pharmacy claim. So in other words, whenever a licensed pharmacy um, dispenses a drug to a family packed patient, they will do their pharmacy claims through the Medi-Cal RX portal. Okay, but it does not include pharmacy services that are billed as clinic dispense drugs or institutional claims. Those claims are done the way that they used to be done. But I just want to remind you that if you want to get an up-to-date copy of the Medi-Cal formulary, you would no longer go to the medical.org website. Instead, you're going to go, I'm sorry, to the familypack.org website. You're not going to use that one anymore. Instead, you're going to use Medi-Cal RX. It's very easy when you go to that website. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the, oops, there we go. It's up at the top here, Medi-Cal RX at dhcs.ca.gov home. So you go to the Welcome to Medi-Cal Rx. In the um, question box, type in Family Pact. It will take you right to the Family Pact formula in, in a very slick, easy to understand uh, way. So that's how you're gonna find out what's covered by Family Pact. And by the way, you can also go to this particular link and it will take you straight to the uh, Family Pact formula as well. All right, last topic in regard to oral contra I mean, in regard to contraceptives is to tell you about a new progestin only pill, but again, I want to emphasize it's not a family pack or a medical benefit. It is a drospirinone progestin only pill called SLIND. It has four milligrams of drospirinone, which is the same progestin which is in Yaz, Yasmin, Osella. Uh, and it has some of the same things that you're aware of regarding. Uh, drosperinone. It has an anti-androgenic effect at the hair follicle and therefore may be beneficial for reducing um, facial hair and acne. It has a diuretic effect like spironolactone and so since people are urinating more it may make their um, premenstrual disorder, uh, uh, premenstrual dis distress disorder, PMDD, less. And then for a person who's got a medical condition that makes their potassium levels high, um, the recommendation is to check a person's potassium level during the first cycle of using um, SLIND just to make sure it hasn't gone up even more. But that's only for people who have had a problem with high, high potassium levels to start with. The way that this one is used is with a 24-4 dosing regimen, 24 days on, four days off for the hormone-free interval. But this one has a full 24-hour missed pill window which is not true of most of the other progestin only pills. Also, it has no estrogen, and therefore there's no thromboembolic risk and no black box warning, as there are with combined oral contraceptives. So remember the other progestin only pill or mini pill which is out there is Norethindra, Micronor, and generic versions of that uh, in comparison to, to, uh, uh, to SLIM. So in the case of bleeding, people who use Norethindrone progestin-only pills are relatively more likely to have breakthrough bleeding. On the other hand, with um, the drospirinone progestin-only pill, the four-day hormone-free interval allows much more scheduled bleeding. Number two is that the norethindrone progestin-only pill really doesn't inhibit ovulation. It only thickens cervical mucus. While with the drospirinone pill, it actually inhibits ovulation. Then the third point is, is that Micronor and the generics, because of the short half-life of norethindrone, have to be taken exactly the same time every day. While with SLIND, because it has a long half-life of 30 hours, you have that, that sort of grace period where you don't have to take the pill at exactly the same time every day. So it's more forgiving if you uh, don't take it at, at, uh, at the same time every day. So its efficacy is that its typically used failure rate is four pregnancies per 100 couples per year. It is expensive. And again, because it's not covered by Medi-Cal or Family Pact, I can't give you a reimbursement rate. But my benchmark for prices are to go to an app which is called GoodRx, which gives you the lowest retail price in your community. And 
at least where I live in San Rafael, it's $196 per cycle, although I think that um, coupons are available for that. So it is marketed basically to females who can't or won't use estrogen, uh, who want to use a progestin-only pill that is more forgiving of not taking it at exactly the same time. What I do want to remind you is that there is no generic version. Okay, one last thing about uh, contra oh, contraceptives, and then we're going to switch very quickly to an STD topic. And that is that hopefully you followed the fact that the labeling for a number of different long-acting contraceptive methods have been changed in the last year um, to make them more realistic and more evidence-based. So what I'm comparing in the middle column is now the FDA-approved duration of action in comparison to the evidence-based duration of action. All of these things on the list, by the way, are family pack benefits. So Paragard is approved for 10 years. The evidence says it works for 12 years. Mirena works for seven years. Now the package insert has been changed to say that it works for seven years. It might even work for eight years, but at least the packaging now says seven years. For Lyletta, evidence says it works seven years. It's now labeled for six years. Kylina has evidence for five years of efficacy and it's labeled for five years. And then down at the bottom, both DMPA IM and DMPA sub Q are FDA approved for injection every 13 weeks, but there's really good evidence that the, that the injection rate can actually be every 15 weeks and it'll still be equally efficacious. So um, an important update in terms of, of, the, um, of the labeling of these various IUDs. So in the last 10 minutes or so, because I do want to give you um, uh, time for Q&A, of course, this is not a repeat of my whole talk talk that we did a year ago with Ina Park, but um, just a quick update about updates regarding um, antibiotics that are covered by family packed for sexually transmitted infections. So first question is, is does family pack cover multi-site sampling? And of course, what I'm referring to here is that we should always be asking when we take a sexual history for patients, um, males and females, not only do you have genital sex, but do you have anal sex or do you have oral sex? And you can break that down into, um, uh, uh, into insertive sex or receptive sex, but you wanna know about those sites basically, okay? Now, one of the reasons that that's important is that in order to find chlamydia and gonorrhea, not only in the penis of men in the vagina or cervix of females is the fact that we also don't want to miss rectal infections or oral pharyngeal infections. And in the case of men having sex with men, 70% of gonorrhea and chlamydia infections of the rectum or the throat are going to be missed if you only do a urine sample for males. And this comes from the new CDC guidelines, which basically says that for people who have insertive anal sex, or I'm sorry, insertive intercourse, that is penis to vagina sex, that, that a male should be screened with a urinucleic acid application test for chlamydia and gonorrhea. For receptive anal course, a rectal GCCT, for receptive oral intercourse, a pharyngeal gonorrhea net, they say you really don't need a pharyngeal chlamydia test, but the point is, is that all the tests for gonorrhea also include chlamydia, so there's really no way to split them out, okay? So that has been a guideline for at least 10 years, that for men having sex with men, we should screen all three sites. What is relatively new has to do with multi-site screening in females. So what the new CDC guidelines say is that for cis women, based on sexual history, in the preceding year, not routinely, for a person who's had receptive anal course, do a rectal GC chlamydia net. For people who had receptive oral intercourse, do a pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia net, based on a shared decision with, um, with the patient. And again, like the study I showed you a moment ago in males, the same is true of females. So this is a big study done in a number of STD clinics with 5,500 women uh, who are at high risk. And they were, they were screened orally, in the vagina and in the rectum. And it turns out that if chlamydia was found in the rectum, the vaginal chlamydia test was positive 65% of the time, but it was negative a third of the time. 
And if gonorrhea was found in the rectum, basically in a, in a majority of circumstances, the two thirds of cases, the genital, in other words, the vaginal sample was negative. So in other words, if we only screen the vagina in females, we may miss a significant, a significant amount of, let's say rectal chlamydia and rectal gonorrhea. Okay, so that's why you always have to ask about, about, about which orifices you're having sex with, uh, sex in or what body parts you're using to have sex. Okay? This slide goes through a little bit more detail about current anatomy and gender of sex partners, uh, transgender females who have had a vaginoplasty, and transgender men who have had a metoidioplasty, um, which is um, you know, basically uh, uh, surgery uh, in, uh, in, in order to create a penis. Okay. Now, just to, also a quick reminder about where to take these samples. When you're sampling oropharyngeally, get it from the tonsillar pillars. When you're sampling the rectum, put the swab in three or four centimeters and don't just like twist it. What you want to do instead is to twirl your wrist 360 degrees um, so that you're sampling the entirety of the rectal sidewalls, not just whatever stool happens to be in the rectum. You get a much more accurate uh, sample that way. Okay, so what does this have to do with family pact? That is multi-site gonorrhea and chlamydia screening is covered both by family pact and Medi-Cal where you can do up to three tests for gonorrhea and chlamydia per day as of September 2018. One in the throat, one in the genital tract, um, one in the rectum as clinically indicated. Be sure to use a separate NAP test kit for each of the genital sample, the anal sample, and the oropharyngeal sample. I get questions all the time about when you sample those three different sites, are they three different tests, three different CPT codes? And the answer is no, it's all the same test, it's all the same CPT code. Uh, you just have to label your samples very clearly for where the sample came from. And remember on the lab slips to include the ICD-10 diagnosis code for why you did that screening in the first place. Okay, next question. Uh, there has been a switch in how we treat chlamydia infection. So the new CDC guidelines say that the recommended regimen for treating chlamydia is doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice a day for a week. The alternative is to use azithromycin one gram orally in a single dose. So you might recognize that, that the old guideline was start with azithromycin, doxycycline was an alternative. Now that's flipped on itself so that doxycycline uh, uh, twice a day for a week is the preferred approach. Okay, That's because it works better, particularly for um, chlamydia in the rectum. Now, it, the, the old recommendation for pregnancy is still in place. Of course, we don't like to use doxycycline in pregnancy because of effects that it has on fetal bone development. So during pregnancy, we still use azithromycin in a single dose. So um, I think I need to park for this flowchart, but basically what it says is if you think a person may have rectal chlamydia, they have to be treated with doxy because it works better. If a person's pregnant, they have to be treated with azithro because we can't use doxy. In anyone else, let's say, for example, you tell a patient that she or he has chlamydia, the recommendation is a week of doxy, and a person might say, I've taken that before, it makes me sick, or I can't remember to take two pills a day for a week. And in that circumstance, it's acceptable to use azithromycin. We'd rather, sorry, we would rather, we would rather see them um, use doxycycline, but if not, it would be acceptable to use uh, azithromycin. Okay, now what about gonorrhea infections? Here's a reminder that the treatment for uncomplicated gonorrhea in the cervix, in the urethra, and in the rectum is ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM for people who weigh under 150 kilograms, and it's a ceftriaxone of full gram IM for people who weigh more than 150 kilograms. Now, that's the treatment for gonorrhea. And if you have not ruled out chlamydia, then you follow that with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. So if you do a gonorrhea and chlamydia NAT test, the gonorrhea test is positive, the chlamydia test is negative, 
then you use ceftriaxone 500 milligrams as the sole treatment. But on the other hand, let's say a patient comes in and says, my boyfriend was diagnosed as having gonorrhea, I need to be treated. You don't have a chlamydia result at that point. So in that circumstance, you use 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone followed by doxycycline with it for a week. Okay, and you can see at the bottom that the CDC is no longer recommending ceftriaxone plus azithromycin for a number of reasons. Now, what if in your clinic you don't stock injectable ceftriaxone? So here the guidelines say that an alternative for gonorrhea treatment is cefixime. You may know that by its trade name of Suprax, but there are many generic versions. So it's cefixime 800 milligrams given orally once to treat gonorrhea. Again, if, you're, if you haven't ruled out chlamydia, then you would add doxycycline for a week. So here are two oral medications that you can use to treat uh, gonorrhea, okay? Now, finally, there's one exception to that rule, and that's pharyngeal gonorrhea, because pharyngeal gonorrhea has a, does not have a, a good treatment success rate with that um, oral medication. In order to treat pharyngeal gonorrhea, you have to use injected ceftriaxone. 500 milligrams IM given once, higher dose for people uh, who have a heavier body weight. And not only that, but the CDC recommends doing a test of cure after treating pharyngeal gonorrhea, seven to 14 days after treatment. Now remember that, that with a NAT test for gonorrhea, you may pick up dead organisms for a week or even 10 days that would give you a false positive test for cure. So Ina Park and others like to say, wait at least 10 days or so before you do the test of cure uh, uh, after treating pharyngeal gonorrhea with ceftriaxone, just to make sure that you don't get a false positive test, okay? Let me just skip over this. It's why the change was made, and that is less, there, there are more azithromycin uh, resistant strains of gonorrhea. Now, as far as family pack goes, the PPBI has been updated to, mod to include all of these CDC recommendations for treating chlamydia and gonorrhea that I just mentioned. Um, okay, were there any changes in the guidelines regarding patient-delivered partner therapy? A few. And re remember that when you diagnose a patient with gonorrhea or chlamydia, it used to be that the contact tracing of partners might be done by the local health department. That definitely cannot be done anymore. The reason why is that the county health departments are so busy with work around the pandemic and COVID-19 that they just can't chase down partners for gonorrhea and chlamydia anymore. So the CDC in the 2021 guideline makes it really clear that it's up to the provider and the patient to get in touch with partners. Now, how can you get partners treated? Well, one is to have the patient bring the partner with her. It's called BYOP or bring your own partner works great, but most of the time the partner won't help. So alternatively, and in this order, the CDC recommends what's called patient-delivered partner therapy. So number one is provide the patient with antibiotics intended for the partner. And in many clinics, that's called a partner pack. You just hand the patient extra medication for up to five partners. Or you can prescribe extra doses in the index patient's name or you can write prescriptions in the partner's name. All of those are acceptable, but kind of in that order. So what Family Pack says about that is that if a Family Pack client is diagnosed with gonorrhea, chlamydia, or trichomoniasis, and expedited partner therapy is necessary to prevent reinfection, either you can dispense medication to the client to give to their partner, all the way up to five partners, or you can provide the client with a prescription in the client's name, not, not the partner's name, but the client's name, with enough quantity and duration to be able to treat acute infection, not only in the client, but in her partners as well, okay? And that's been a family pack benefit since August of 2020. And it's also a Medi-Cal benefit. So the public health value of getting partners treated is so high, you don't need to see the partner and Family Pact and Medi-Cal will pay for those antibiotics to treat partners. Next is what about treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease? And here the guidelines have changed as well. Based on randomized control trial of women who had PID, and they got 
shot of ceftriaxone, doxycycline for two weeks, and then they were randomized either to the addition of metronidazole or placebo. Okay, here's what the findings were: that whether or not you got metronidazole, by three days it was an equal response rate. But for people who also got metronidazole, they were less likely to have anaerobes in the endometrium, less likely to have mycoplasma genitalium, and reduce cervical motion tenderness and pelvic tenderness, and therefore they concluded that metronidazole should be routinely added uh, for treatment of PID. So this is the current recommendation for treatment of PID. It is a family pack benefit, and all these are covered, particularly ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams IM, and then a prescription for doxycycline for 14 days with metronidazole for 14 days. Okay. Next is the question of mycoplasma genitalium has come up, okay, which is an organism that in particular can cause a problem with recurrent cervicitis and recurrent urethritis. Okay, about 2% of sexually active people have mycoplasma genitalium. It's significantly higher in STD clinics. And there seems to be an association between having a mycoplasma genitalium infection with having cervicitis, PID, preterm birth, spontaneous abortion. We know it's an epidemiologic association, but we're not sure whether or not it's a cause and effect relationship. So there is a NAT test available called the Aptima Mycoplasma Genitalium Assay, which is available for both males and females. It's very accurate in, in terms of sensitivity and, and specificity. So, the CDC guidelines published last year basically have recommendations for the use of the mycoplasma genitalium NAT, mainly for the diagnosis of recurrent urethritis in both females and males, cervicitis and PID. But they, they did not issue any recommendation regarding using the mycoplasma genitalium assay as like general screening. And I've got many questions about this. I know it's also true in the OFP. Can we use the MGen test just to screen high-risk people? And the answer to that is definitely not, at least as a family pack benefit, because it's not recommended by the CDC. The CDC says you can use the mycoplasma genitalia mat for people who have recurrent urethritis, recurrent cervicitis, or who have pelvic inflammatory disease. They also pointed out that there's a new treatment for mycoplasma genitalium. It's doxycycline for a week, followed by moxifloxacin for a week. So it is sequential. And they've basically gotten rid of azithromycin as a treatment for mycoplasma genitalium because there's a very high rate of resistance. So the mycoplasma genitalium test is covered as a diagnostic test in family pact. And, that, and that's been a benefit for all of about a week and a half. Uh, ever since uh, the 1st of May of this year. And it's available as a diagnostic test for persistent or recurrent cervicitis, non-gonococcal urethritis of the penis that has not responded to doxycycline or azithromycin, and family pack covers both of the drugs uh, that are used. Okay, now skip over syphilis. I'm gonna get to one last thing. Sorry again for all the noise outside. And I will um, remind you about what's going on with vaginal trichomoniasis. By the way, I, I skipped over syphilis just because the family pack benefits for syphilis haven't changed and the CDC recommendations regarding syphilis haven't changed much other than the fact that they say that in anybody in whom you diagnose syphilis, you really ought to have a conversation with them about PrEP. And of course, PrEP is not a family pack benefit at this point. Okay, so in regard to vaginal trichomoniasis, Basically, the CDC and the 2021 guidelines say that we should screen cis women having HIV once a year, screen cis women in corrections, like in, in, in a jail or a prison, annually, and then consider screening for trichomoniasis in people who are at increased risk of sexually transmitted infections, which they define as newer multiple partners, history of sexually transmitted infections, and so on. But Boy, this is really an unsatisfying recommendation because what do they mean by consider screening rather than either do it or don't do it? Well, the point is, is that in, in Family Pact, we do have some new tests that are available 
but we haven't actually adopted those CDC recommendations yet about, about uh, screening everyone for trichomoniasis. Now, the tests that are covered by Family Pact is the Aptima trichomonas vaginalis assay and the OSOM rapid trick test, and of course, microscopy uh, is covered, um, but they are only covered as diagnostic tests. And then again, um, once you've treated a person for trichomoniasis, they need to be retested three months after treatment. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's changed is the recommended treatment for vaginal trichomoniasis. Okay, remember it used to be two grams of metronidazole as a single dose. Now this study was published in 2018, which showed that the, that the success rate in treating vaginal trichomoniasis with a single dose is 81%. The cure rate of a seven day treatment is 89%. So now the CDC guidelines recommend treating females who have vaginal trichomoniasis with metronidazole 500 milligrams twice a day for a week. They've also changed the recommendation about metronidazole use in alcohol. And they say based on this study from Scandinavia that having people refrain from alcohol use is unnecessary um, during treatment. Okay, that's also a change in the 2020 guideline. So finally then, the, the recommendation regarding treatment for trichomoniasis is that females should be treated with metronidazole 500 milligrams twice a day for a week. Males can be treated with metronidazole two grams as a single dose, and the alternative is tinidazole two grams uh, as one dose. And again, the family pack benefits are the trick NAT test and the OSOM rapid trick as diagnostic test, and all of these CDC recommendations are covered. The last two slides I'm going to show you are where to get more information. So Family Pact has an absolutely wonderful website at familypact.org. And just recently, the California Prevention Training Center has updated this um, page that has to do with clinical resources. So to get the monthly Family Pact update, you can go to this section on policy to see the full policy procedures and billing instructions, you can go here. If you want to download a table that has all of Family Pact benefits, download the Family Pact benefit grid. You can see the Family Pact standards, reimbursement rates for on-site um, medication dispensing, uh, and so on. Okay, so very, very last slide, and that is just to remind you if you have an STD question um, that um, the uh, the uh, prevention training centers, there are a number of them in, that, in the United States, and of course, ours is the California Prevention Training Center. They have a STD consultation network where if you've got a question about a complicated case, go to the website, put in your zip code, they'll tell you how to get in touch with the infectious disease clinician who's an ex STD expert who will be able to answer your questions about sexually transmitted infections. So with that, um, I'm going to try to answer a couple of questions, but I will tell you that as with other webinars, um, what I don't get to, um, I, I, we, we will do a written Q&A and you'll be able to, uh, um, to see the answers to all these questions, including the ones that I, that I didn't uh, get to. So can Anavera be used continuously? Um, the answer to that is uh, yes, a person can but you should really tell the, the individual that that's just based on a single modeling study. Um, and uh, you know we don't have a whole lot of clinical trials of that yet, but it's reasonable to believe that Anavera can be used nonstop, even, even more noise. Next question, if a patient has vaginal candidiasis or bacterial vaginosis and wants to use a vaginal cream or gel, do they need to remove the hormonal ring um, during treatment? And, and the answer to that is no. As, as I mentioned during the talk, there have been studies done with a couple of different antifungal drugs, uh, as well as metronidazole vaginal gel. And they work well, even though a ring is in place. And number two, they don't cut down on the hormone levels that are released from the ring. So yes, you can use those treatments for a vaginal infection. Uh, and um, uh, and the ring at the same time. 
So what's the best way to store the Anovera ring when it's out for withdrawal leave? Um, Imelda, you stumped me on that. I, I don't know the answer, but I, I will, uh, I will um, put that into the written Q&A. Uh, the question, the, the next question after that is exactly the same thing. And that is um, uh, basically what's done with the Anovera um, during the hormone-free interval. Uh, let's see. Um, does Medi-Cal cover FEXI? The answer to that is yes. Is FEXI reimbursable with hormonal methods at the same time? Um, I didn't see anything as I looked at the FEXI benefit that said that it would not be, but I will certainly give you an opinion about that. I, I think that that is not a really, not a good idea. Now, is it safe to use a hormonal method and FEXI at the same time? Sure, why not? Uh, on the other hand, got, you know, the question is, why would you do that? I mean, because you could see that FEXI is really quite expensive, $21 for every applicator. So I don't understand what the logic would be of using FEXI at exactly the same time that you would be using a hormonal method. Yeah, I get the idea about using a spermicide and using oral contraceptives at the same, at the same time. But uh, I think for a person who's using their method, uh, quite effectively, they probably don't need a vaginal method as a backup. And if you were to do that, I would do that with, with one of the nonoxonol sperm sites rather than doing that with, uh, with vaccine. Um, and of course, let's wait until we get even more evidence about gonorrhea and chlamydia, and then we might have a different attitude at that time. Can a clinic charge family pack for injection of DMPA sub-Q if a patient picks it up from a pharmacy and brings it to the clinic? Seems like less pain, et cetera, with sub-Q, uh, and that might be preferable to some patients. And, and the answer to that is, yeah, I don't see why not. In other words, it would be um, a low-level E&M code for that visit, or it would be the injection code. Actually, Benefact doesn't cover injection code. So it would be a low-level injection code, um, like a 99211 or a 99212, for example. Um, of course, you can't build for the drug itself. The person has gone to the pharmacy, picked up the drug, takes it back to the clinic if that's where she wants it injected, uh, and then that would be a low-level um, uh, ENM code uh, for that. It just sort of defeats the purpose. It seems to me that if a person's going to come in, why not just do the, the Depo 150? But on the other hand, if they like the idea of the lower dose, they like the idea of the smaller needle, but they can't learn how to inject it themselves, then I think it's reasonable for them to come to the clinic at that time. So I know that this is a contraception talk, but how does drospirinone affect lactation? Most of my patients are infants with breastfeeding mothers. And, and the answer is, is that, um, geez, you know, I've got, I've got to say, again, I, I apologize for this, because of the fact that it's not a family factor or a Medi-Cal benefit, I haven't read through the entirety of the drospirinone um, SLIN uh, patient package insert that would give you an idea about whether or not it's safe to use it uh, with breastfeeding mothers. I will tell you this, that there's obviously decades of information about using norethindrone in breastfeeding women. We know that that's entirely safe and it doesn't cut down on the amount of breast milk. On the other hand, with SLIND, it's probably so new that those studies have not been done yet uh, in regard to looking at the safety of SLIND in breastfeeding women, let alone the fact that it's so hard to, to get because of the fact that it's not covered by Medi-Cal and it's not covered by Family Pact. So that's a topic which is likely to evolve over time uh, when we learn, um, number one, when SLIN becomes uh, a more widely available benefit, uh, particularly in Medi-Cal and fam Family Pact. And number two, we'll probably see some things uh, that, uh, that have to do about it, safety in breastfeeding. I just don't think that's out there yet. Next, do I recommend against a rectal self swab? Boy, you know, that's, that's a really good question for, for Ina Park, but I've got to tell you that unless a person is able to do that trick with really flipping their wrist in such a way that they're actually swabbing the rectal sidewalls, I think that this is going to be much more accurate if it's done by a clinician than if it's done by a patient. Now, there may be information in the STI literature about self-rectal swabs. I'm not entirely familiar with it, but 
I think to the degree that we're doing rectal swabs, they need to be done correctly, which is that wide swing of the wrist that you do to get the rectal sidewalls. Um, okay, so we are getting denied from Family Pack for doing multi-site testing. You shouldn't be. And uh, email the Office of Family Planning and let them know about what you're running into uh, uh, into as a problem. So next question is, should the oh, wait, use of this... I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make sure to be on time, to be respectful of the time. We're right at 1.30, but I know in the past you've been able to stay like an extra 15 minutes to answer questions. So would you like to do that? And then that way, if you need to drop off, they're yeah. welcome to. But then that way you give a little extra time to, to answer more questions. Um, um, so so the answer is I'm, I'm fine with staying another 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, and then again, yeah, everything's really recorded, good. so we'll get everything out. Then. We have to leave and get back to patients. Of, of course, feel free and you'll be able to see all these um, answers in writing. But for those of you who can stay for another 10 minutes, I'll try to answer more questions. Uh, let's see. Can I speak to the efficacy of self-collection for rectal and pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia? I, I just did to the degree that I, that I know about. I would definitely not be a fan of pharyngeal gonorrhea chlamydia collection that way because for people to use the swab to swab their tonsillar pillars almost always causes a gag reflex. So I can't rem imagine how a patient themselves, even if they're looking in a mirror, is going to be able to get a good oropharyngeal sample without gagging. That really needs to be done by someone, by a clinician, an uh, MA, and so on. And I've already answered that for a, for a rectal sample, that you need that wide swing. Okay. All right. Let's see. Should the use of azithromycin be discontinued? And, and the answer is no. I mean, azithromycin, remember, is still an alternative therapy for chlamydia, perfectly fine for that. But, uh, it, but it's not first choice. The treatment of choice for chlamydia is seven days of doxycycline, but for the patient who can't or won't take doxycycline, um, for the person who's pregnant, then azithromycin for chlamydia is completely appropriate. Now, when it comes to gonorrhea, 5% of gonorrhea um, isolates are no longer sensitive to azithromycin, and that number is going up, up, and up, and up every year. So that's why azithromycin is not considered to be an appropriate drug for gonorrhea any longer. So for gonorrhea, you're going to use either ceftriaxone or suffixin. Next question, is the test of cure at the 7 uh, to 14 day mark paid for by family? The answer to that is yes. And that's an important question because remember previously, Family Pact, and I think even Medi-Cal, had an edit where when you did a gonorrhea or chlamydia nucleic acid application test, basically you could only do one per 30 days, okay? That requirement has now gone away. And the point is you can do up to three a day and then you can do follow-ups soon after that as clinically indicated. And that would include a test of cure. So the point is, is that if a person, let's say, is treated for pharyngeal gonorrhea, they come back 10 days later in order to have a test of cure for the pharyngeal gonorrhea, then that one will be covered by family pact. It will not hit a 30-day edit and be denied. Okay. And, and by the way, I want to go back um, for a moment, you know, for these questions from Jessica. You know, I'm I was feeling pressed for time, but I really want to be able to, an to answer this. We are being denied from Family Pack for multi-site testing. That you know what I just mentioned. That is genital, oral, and rectal. That doesn't make sense that you would be denied because you're not doing those tests. It's the laboratory that's doing the test. So if you take three different samples for NAD test, those three samples are sent to Quest or to another laboratory. If they're denied. It's Quest that's being denied. It's not your clinic, okay? So unless Jessica actually works for Quest or actually works for a clinical lab and you're asking the question of why those three samples are being denied payment to the laboratory, then, then I think that that's a completely reasonable question, although I don't know why the laboratory would be denied. But as far as your clinic goes, you should not be billing for those nucleic acid amplification tests. The one you know, uh, sort of exception to that rule is Planned Parenthood, which has its own sort of reference lab. But 
most family planning clinics, even though you can do point of care tests on site, that doesn't include gonorrhea and chlamydia. You send those out. And therefore, it, the group that's being denied is the laboratory, it's not your clinic. Okay, so what diagnosis code is required for partner treatment? We've been getting some denials um, with only the gonorrhea or the chlamydia code. Do we need to add exposure to STI code to come? Well, all of that is contained in the PPBI, which unfortunately is not in front of me, but there are about 10 different codes that can be used for a variety of circumstances of treating sexually transmitted infections. So sometimes it's because you're in a high risk um, hotspot. Sometimes it's because of a fact that the patient had a high risk contact. Sometimes it's because the patient has had one STD and SJI and now you're screening for other STIs. Okay, but the PPI should be um, clear and, uh, you know, in, in terms of which, in fact, it is quite clear in terms of which codes you're going to use in which circumstances. I'll certainly put that into the written responses. Um, but you shouldn't be getting denials uh, as it relates to treating partners, because that very clearly is a family pack benefit. Okay, so again, I'm seeing the same test. This one is from Shannon, who left that the chlamydia test from three sites, same day of service, has not been a covered benefit. Family pact is only covering one, sometimes two, but never three. Again, something's wrong there, unless you're a laboratory because otherwise you should not be billing family pact for gonorrhea and chlamydia tests since they are sent out to a laboratory. We're not doing them on site. Okay, so how do you provide a client with prescriptions for their partners in their like in your electronic health record such as Epic? Sorry, Kim, I really can't answer that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, how you go about doing that because of course uh, an EHR like Epic is like tweaked for each place that it is, uh, that, that I mean that it's used. So I don't have a good answer for you there. Uh, let's see, next one. Boy, this is pure true. Pharmacies no longer want to take written prescriptions, which is how we used to describe, um, prescribe rather for partners and for family members. So, so the, 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 the way to, to do that, as I mentioned earlier, and this is nicely described in the PBBI, is you write or, or you, you, you take into account the fact that you're providing partner treatment by increasing the number of tablets, for example, that you're prescribing for the patient. So let's say, for example, your patient has gonorrhea, okay, and you don't have injectable ceftriaxone. So you're going, to, you're going to be using cefixime and maybe doxycycline for a week, all right? Now she has three partners. So therefore you have to treat the patient and the three partners. So the way that you, you do your, your prescription, and I understand it's electronically transmitted, is basically for four doses. It's for the patient and three of her partners, but it's all in her name. Medi-Cal and Family Parent, through the Medi-Cal Rx website, are now set up to be able to pay for that, okay? And and particularly by electronic transmission of those prescriptions, it doesn't have to be written. But that makes that makes it a lot easier than having to write a separate prescription for a partner. Instead, what you do is you write it for the patient, you just double it, triple it, quadruple it, and all of that, and of course document that, and all of that is going to be um, covered by family pay. Next is, is Medi-Cal also covering MGen as a diagnostic test? Well, I can tell you that the Medi-Cal website says that it is covered. What I don't know the answer to is how individual Medi-Cal managed care health plans are covering it. So let's say your patient you know, has Medi-Cal coverage through CalOptima or through um, the San Francisco health plan or through partnership health plan you would have to look at those individual Medi-Cal managed care health plans to see if they're covering it. But if the person is state fee-for-service Medi-Cal, it's covered. And of course, in family pet, uh, it's, it's covered. Okay, another question is, in one of the slides, um, I use the abbreviation IDU next to sex work. What does that mean? It refers to intravenous drug use. 
So if the person is a needle user or a needle sharer, that is a significantly increased risk for HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B. So um, I, I realize we're almost at 140, so let me just hit one or two more. So given the congenital syphilis rate, family pact, be considering covering point of care syphilis testing to improve the early diagnosis and treatment of reproductive age people? And the answer is yes, that is, that is being considered right now. So one of the things I didn't have time for, we did cover this last year in the STD uh, webinar with Dr. Park, was that there are some labs that are still doing what's called the traditional algorithm of screening for syphilis, which is a non-treponemal test, like a VDRL or an RPR, which is then followed by a treponemal test. Now many labs have flipped that, and they're doing something else, which is called the reverse sequence algorithm which is actually to start with a treponemal test, like an enzyme immunoassay, and if that's positive, then to back that up with a non-treponemal test. So you really need to know what your lab is doing. And the point that Catherine is making here is that there are now a couple of point-of-care tests for syphilis, which are treponemal tests, looks directly for the spirochete, okay, that are available in clinic. And wouldn't that be a really good way to make an early diagnosis of syphilis? Well, yes and no. Yes, you can get certainly a positive test of that EIA, which implies that the person may have syphilis, but it still has to be confirmed in the next step, which is the non-treponemal test, and that's got to be sent out to a lab. But at, at some point, we should be able to have point-of-care testing for syphilis, which is both a screening test and a confirmatory test we don't have yet. All right, I'm just going to see if there's one more quick one. Can depo be billed when the MA delivers the depo shot? The answer to that is yes. It is clearly outlined in the PPI about how to do that. How about checking blood pressure when using hormonal contraception for a year? The answer is it, it's unnecessary. There's no, no reason that you should have to do that. If you had an initial blood pressure, which showed that that was normal in a person with no history of hypertension, perfectly fine to go ahead and uh, prescribe for a full year. Okay, a few others, they're kind of repetitive, um, given the fact that, uh, well, let me answer one more very fast because it's such an easy answer, and that is, <clears throat> does Medi-Cal cover Gardasil 9 beyond age, age 18? The answer is Medi-Cal does. Then the other question is, does Family Pack cover? Gardasil 9, the answer to that is not yet, but it's being considered. So it's another one of those things, like the syphilis test that I mentioned a moment ago, where the Office of Family Planning is considering coverage, and that's something that we'll be talking about later this summer or um, uh, potentially in the fall. So anyway, thank you for hanging in there for an extra 12 minutes, and um, probably by the middle of next week, I will have all these questions answered. Um, in writing, and they will be available for you with both the recording of what we just did, as well as um, the answers to all your questions. So, Nicole, I'll hand, I'll hand the yeah. microphone back to you. Yes, no, thank you so much. That was quite a lightning round, notable card, and there's still so many questions. But yes, we will collect them and get those answers out for you. Um, please make sure you uh, set up that survey at the end for us. That really helps us a lot. And again, CME's link, recording slides, the uh, the Q&As, we'll get them all out to you in about two weeks. And then thank you again for our wonderful presenters, Lamont and then Dr. Pulakar. This was like definitely one of your superstar pre presentation for sure. Lots of information you were able to pack in. So um, thank you all for joining us. And I hope we all, you all stay safe and have a great rest of your week. All right. Bye.